The Full Exposure Podcast is made possible by Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn in appreciation for the contributions that artists and creative minds provide to our community. Arts and culture are essential to a rich and rewarding life, strengthening our overall well-being and our appreciation of all that we see, hear, and experience. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of Full Exposure with me, your host, Brian Kelly. Today's a very special episode. It kicks off what we're calling On Location Episodes, and that is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I love shooting and, and uh, having our conversations for the podcast in my studio in Grand Rapids, Michigan. However, it's been my dream to bring the podcast out on the road and to meet people who aren't in Grand Rapids and aren't just conveniently in town. And today's episode is the first of a series of amazing, I hate saying amazing all the time, but it is amazing. Uh, We have some really great on-location podcasts coming up, a whole slew of them from Detroit and Los Angeles area. And um, without the help of uh, Metro Health University, Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn, we would not uh, be able to do this and afford to bring it on the road. So special thanks to them again for their continued partnership with us. It's it's an exciting time for the podcast, and um, I'm very excited about this episode. Um, A lot of you may not know Dwele. Dwele is a legendary R&B singer from Detroit, And um, it's just kind of ironic how life works and meanders through opportunities that you don't really think you'll have, and then you have an opportunity to do something with somebody, and uh, it turns into something you didn't expect. And um, my friendship with Dwele is one of those things that happened and evolved um, very organically, but uh, accidentally almost. And that brings me to something very important I'd like to talk to you about. I know that many of you are creatives. You might be photographers or filmmakers or graphic designers or you're in some type of creative field. And I just want to take a moment and underscore, because of this episode with Dwele, the importance of just doing personal projects and work that you do with no expectation other than it's something creative that you wanted to do and express There's no client, there's no money involved, there's nothing except pure passion involved. And um, the reason I bring that up is because of this relationship that I have with Dwele and many other people in Detroit. And um, I first got to know Dwele in 2013 when I photographed him for a series of portraits I was making in Detroit, and it was called Detroit Portraits. And um, this portrait project was probably the most influential series of images that I've ever made. And I say that not because uh, the images are, you know, uh, spectacular in any way, but the uh, relationships that I've maintained through meeting people through this portrait project in Detroit has been spectacular. Some of the most spectacular friendships I have today are based in Detroit or were born out of that uh, portrait projects. And um, and I would say that nearly all of the, probably I think 50 or 60 portraits I made during a two or three year period in Detroit, um, most of those people are still very much in my life today in one way or another. And when you're doing personal work like that, you don't really have that five or 10 year window into the future to know how is this going to affect my life down the road and um, that's what's cool about personal projects I I just continue to encourage any creative in any field to uh, do work for for no other reason than it's something you wanted to pursue and uh, I guarantee you that the benefits of that uh, are long term they might not be evident right away but uh, you will get uh, you will get highly rewarded in one way or another through embarking on personal projects. So back to my, uh, just to tie up the loose end here with Dwele, is in 2015, I was interested in running a photo studio in Detroit, and uh, Dwele and another guy named Shades, who you'll meet in the next episode, uh, turned me on to this space in the same building as Dwele's loft and where Shades was living that's very much full of artists and musicians, a very cool space at 2000 Brooklyn Street 
in Detroit legendary building, long history of artists there. And uh, I, I took this space uh, and rented it. And, um, and Dwelly and I started bumping into each other a lot more frequently. You know, I was in the neighborhood. I was in the same building. And we became better friends even after that first portrait we shot together. And we began collaborating on additional portraits and other uh, things as well. And kind of the rest is history. But uh, let me formally introduce Dwelly. Uh, he's a Grammy Award winner, pro people. How many people do you know that have a Grammy? Well, Dwelle is one of them. And um, with one Grammy Award in his pocket and multiple Grammy nominations in his acclaimed career, Dwelle has been a Detroit legend and R&B artist for nearly two decades. He started making waves in the Detroit music scene in the late 90s while hustling his own cassette tapes. And he quickly found himself tapped for some, uh, to sing some hooks on a hit song called Tainted for Slum Village, which is a, a legendary uh, rap group. And uh, the timing was perfect, and the intention he received from that single pushed his record label to get behind his first major label album debut. Later, in 2007, Kanye West called on Dwelly to contribute to the song Flashing Lights from his epic album Graduation. It became a global smash hit, and the song won Grammys. In subsequent years, uh, high-profile collaborations with Drake, Common, Big Sean, catapulted Dwelly to an even higher orbit. After five successful solo albums of his own, Dwelly consistently tours around the globe with sellout crowds in his wake. His fans are eagerly anticipating what his next move will be, but just don't comment on his Instagram feed and ask when the new album is coming out because Dwelly's not ready to say when it's coming out yet. Uh, great meandering conversation with Dwelly. Uh, we talk about his uh, passions outside of music, which include bonsai trees, golf, uh, radio control cars. He, he's a big kid. He even says it in the podcast. So uh, without further ado, let's explore the bigger picture in Detroit on location with my friend, and Detroit legend, Dwelle. <laughs> you just got back from South Carolina. So you had a show there. I had a show, South Carolina. What, how much are you on the road right now? By the way, thanks for doing the podcast, man. Oh, man, you know, anytime, B. <laughs> <laughs> the, we, go, we go back a little ways. Yeah. It's probably been six, seven years About maybe that. since I met you. About that. In fact, Shades, we're doing the podcast in uh, Shades is our friend, graffiti artist, and you used to live just below him. Yeah. And so we're borrowing, you don't live down there anymore. No. And I used to have a studio in this building too. So for me, this 2000 Brooklyn is a great, this is, this is where it's it all went. trifecta right here. It's all went down right here. Yeah. This is yeah, my yeah, Detroit yeah. fam right here. Definitely. I don't know if you consider me fam, but you're, come on, you know, man. come on now. I consider you brethren, brethren. You tell me I can't talk in the podcast. You can't. Brethren. You can't, Shades. Stop. Brethren. <laughs> I like that, brethren. Yeah. Uh, well, and uh, actually Shades introduced us because I was doing a portrait. This is how yeah, crazy it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I did a portrait of Sebastian Jackson, and then he told me about Shades. And then I came here a month or two later, did a portrait of Shades, and then literally we were wrapping up the shoot, and I said, anybody you want to recommend? He's like, well, there's Dwelly downstairs. <laughs> you know, you want a Grammy winner? Like, who do you want? You know, like, who, who he, Shades is acting like... Uh... So anyway, then uh, I remember you were not feeling well. That uh, we, we weren't even going to try to do the shoot that day, but you're like, yeah, I'm down to do it if Shades vouches for you. Yeah, And yeah. then ever since then... You can't get rid of me. Ever since then, it's been... Because we're going to end up golfing together. Probably oh, smoke some cigars tonight. That's definitely going down. Yeah, I like that. I like that. But, to be honest, we were joking about just being outside uh, some aspects of uh, various cultures that I am. <laughs> and I didn't... I really come a long ways because of you in terms of Detroit music and the history of Detroit music and I learned about Dilla from you and all those other, you know, because of your early days coming up in Detroit. But 
tell me a little bit way back. So you're from, the, where did you grow up in Detroit? Yeah, west side of Detroit, like off of Joy Road, Southfield Freeway, uh-huh. in that area. Exit 9. Exit 9? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off the lodge? No. No, so uh, off the Southfield South, Freeway. Got yeah, it, yeah, got yeah, it, got yeah. it. Just remember Exit 9. Exit 9. Yeah, if you run into anybody from Detroit, West Side, just be like, Exit 9? <laughs> They're going to be like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, remember that, Exit 9. Back exit pocket. 9, yeah. all right. Okay, yeah. that'll, uh, that'll in- endear me to the community. Definitely. On the, You're welcome. On the South Side. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so you grew up there, but I know uh, you had interest... You must have had interest early on in music, for sure, because you play so many different instruments. It's not like you can just pick that up as an adult. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was definitely in- interested in uh, music. I was interested in a lot of things. I will say that about my parents. They kept me into everything. You know, I did gymnastics, baseball, basketball, soccer. I like three days of soccer. It was too much running. I didn't yeah. like it. You know, but... Um, <laughs> too much running. Yeah. I didn't like running either. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of running. Um but yeah, definitely. You know, music, uh, my people got me a harmonica. I was about maybe eight, nine, and uh, I had the harmonica for about five, ten minutes and came back and played like Mary Had a Little Lamb, and they were like, what is this? And from that, they just started, you know, bringing me different really? instruments. Because I think I a harmonica would be the worst instrument to give a child. That and a kazoo. Yeah. yeah. Just because if you can't play it right, there's nothing well, worse to hear. It depends on what harmonica you get. Because most of them, they have different harmonicas with different keys. So it's not like you can really hit a bad note. Got it. Yeah. It sounds good. And then you get an accidental bend on the, on the harmonica. Like, my son, Ashton, I, got him, I gave him one of my older harmonicas, and he was killing it. Yeah. Like the Stevie Bends. The Stevie Bends. The really? Stevie Bends, yeah. Really? And by that, Ashton you mean ben. Stevie Wonder? Yeah. All right. See, I'm in it. I'm in the pocket. All right. I'm sitting back. All in right. the pocket, just like, so I want to play the bass. That's the thing. And I bought a bass. Mm-hmm. But uh, I kept trying to take lessons, and I, could, I had to, just my schedule, I had to keep canceling on this guy like the day before. And he's a good dude. He's a good teacher. But all I want to do is play bass, funk bass lines. Was that easy, man. Yeah, it's just, it's just that, YouTube. right? YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, just... you don't need anybody. Go to YouTube, man. Really? It's all 2019, right. bro. <laughs> You learn anything? Yeah. On learn YouTube. how to be a bass rock star? Yes. So my goal then is to... Uh, I want to get... cocaine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> my goal is uh, I'm going to practice hard for about two years, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Nancy Kerrigan your bass player's knees, <laughs> and then I'm going to start doing these tours with you. Oh, okay. I'm filling in. Back okay, there. that sounds I'll, good. I'll tighten up the wardrobe. You guys all look pretty great on stage. It's a thing. But I'll, uh, I'll try to clean up my act a little okay. bit. Okay, all good, all good. I won't but, let him know. No, no, don't, don't let him know because you don't know when I'm going to have my bodyguard take him out. I mean, like, what city? Do, I'm doing all the tours, all the dates. No, I mean, like, what oh. city is, is going to happen in? <clears throat> let me think about it because... It probably like Atlantic City or, or something like that. Okay. Jersey. Okay. We'll go hard school in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you, they people get whacked is where we're gonna do it. So it doesn't seem so unusual. Vegas. True. I mean, uh, Tupac got whacked there. Wasn't that too soon? Too soon for Tupac, for sure. Yeah. No, too soon to bring it up like that. Oh, really? Yeah. But we were talking about people... All right. Next and I. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. We can talk about Tupac. It's been a while. And Shug? Come on. <laughs> Shug? Shug Knight. Shug. <laughs> I don't know. See, this is where I'm cutting all this out. <laughs> I got the power of the edit. Oh, after. man. Yes, you do. I got to sound good. I can't sound, uh, I can't sound <laughs> too Grand Rapids, you know? <laughs> Rolling good. in. Is this a prop or is this real water? That's real water. That's for you. Nice. Um... But no, but I always appreciate, so I quickly, so you started playing harmonica, your, your parents are just, you know, infusing you with music, kept you busy with that and a lot of other activities, but when in your timeline, what age were you when you were thinking, because you, you came up, you started to become pretty well known, you were pretty young still, weren't you, like 19, 20, 21, somewhere yeah, in there? Yeah, 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 around that time. So when did you start thinking about music 
being like, I, this, I have to do this. This isn't something I have another option like, for. Like, seriously, I was working at, uh, I was working at Papa Romano's. And um, I started, you know, taking my monies and actually buying equipment and doing what I was pretending to do, you know, with, with the tape decks and, yeah, you know, the little cheap microphone I had. You know, I actually went out and bought some good equipment and started making some decent music. And uh, I had a few people that, you know, rocked with me in Pop Romano's like, yo, what did you make last week? You know, like it was a new mm-hmm. release. They was waiting for it, you know, so... Um, from that, it just got a little bit more serious. I ended up leaving Pop Romano's and started working for AAA. And, uh, AAA, insu- like the insurance The arm? insurance company, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And what what are you doing for them? Uh, at that time, I Where was doing... Where are they? Uh, we need to tap Adwele's <laughs> talents at AAA. Yeah, at that time, I was working in uh, mail services. <laughs> nice. Mail services. Commu- that's a, it's a form of communications that you were working in. There you go. Thank okay. you. Yep. Mail service and communications. Um, But no, it was cool, you know. Uh, Checks were a little bigger now. I could buy, you know, more equipment. Uh And around that time, um, it was around 97, 98. This is when, you know, St. Andrews was popping, you know. um, Yeah. Or the shelter. Uh, Cafe Mahogany was, 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 was really banging on Tuesday nights, you know. So I started meeting a lot of people. Uh, that were kind of in the same vein <clears throat> as I was musically, you know, with hip hop. Back then, I was rapping, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's where I met like Slum Village, you know, By Ten yeah. and, and 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 all of them QD, and we just kind of you know started working together, bouncing ideas off of each other, and I decided to put out you know uh, this album called Rise. Yeah. Uh, they say you have your whole life to work on your first album, and that was my first album, yeah. you know. So put that out, when, when made 100 you, copies, sold them in a week, you know, and I was excited about it, uh, and that was it. That was the start. From that, you know, I... Uh, was these uh, CDs or still cassette days? These are cassettes. Cassettes. Yeah, these are cassettes. cassettes. 100 cassettes. And how sold did you make those? Did you have, did you send it off and have some? Yeah, make actually, them? see, what's crazy, I sent them off, uh, they made the cassettes, sent them back, but I didn't like the quality. There was a lot of air in the yeah. quality, so... Yeah. While I slept, you know, I, I go work at AAA, I come home, and while I slept, I kept, like, the double cassette deck. Yeah. I would take each one, put, like, uh, what, did I have to, what did you have to, like, put tape over the, the, the little holes at the top of the yeah. cassette? I put uh, tape over them, and I re-recorded from a DAT, from a DAT player, I, re- I re-recorded both sides of the tape mm. over. Really? A hundred times, yeah. <laughs> like, when I hear it click, I wake up, flip the tape <laughs> over. Press record, and handmade. Yep. Ha- handmade. Are there still any of those out there? They got yes, a few of them out there. I like, I saw a few on uh, eBay, eBay for a lot of money. Really? My last one I left in the in the windowsill of my uh, eighty nine Probe, and uh, Probe. That was a hot car, dude. I had a, I had an eighty nine Probe in ninety five. That was. Yeah, I remember I had a friend who uh, he was. I don't know his parent. His parent. I was in. It was probably eighty seven. 86 or 87, and he started driving a probe that his parent or his, his dad had one for work or something, mm-hmm. and it was a company car. And one time he picked me up in a in the probe, and I was like, "What is this?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was that was the future a, back then. It man. was, yeah, it was. When you look back at that era though of Detroit music with Slum Village and you know Dilla and that, and when you're in it, you don't really appreciate it. You're just a young man trying to network and make connections. Did it yeah. seem like Detroit? music was easy to network in meaning to make those connections that eventually led to you know you collaborating with them um at that time at that time it did you know everything moved kind of fast and I wasn't really judging like oh that you know it took me two weeks to get here you know what I'm saying it it, it was it was just kind of a thing it just kind of happened um everything really happened organically for me so I can't say it was it was hard to yeah. To get well, I mean, it it seemed when I was, you know, looking through your trajectory that, that it did happen pretty quickly. But I'm wondering what you think of now that era, that that decade, you know, of, 
of music. What did that define for Detroit for you? If you have to like describe that era of what was important in Detroit in the oh, industry man. or just <clears throat> musically, I might be a little biased, but I feel like that time right there, you know, with um, you know, that was like around the time that M. You know, was kind of putting Detroit on. You had Dilla putting Detroit on. You had, uh, but um, you just had a lot of artists. You you had a lot of artists from Detroit actually putting Detroit on for like the first time. It feels like for the first time in in the soul hip hop scene since Motown. Right. You know, since in between that, you had like you had the techno, you had the house. That was that was really making moves, but nobody was really pioneering for like. I think that's right. I never really thought of it that way. But, like, after Motown and the, you know, by the time the 70s end, Motown isn't really as important or influential as it was. And music changed to the mainstreamish type of yeah. culture radio did, MTV did. And then I think there is this whole resurgence that happened around, when was that, late 90s? Yeah, definitely late late 90s. Yeah. And... But it is a distinct sound. But when did you start to pivot from rapping to being this um, soul, you know, R- R- more R&B and soul? Yeah, that happened when uh, they got a hold of the cassette. And, um, you know, management took it and they picked a few songs from the cassette to start shopping to the different labels. And the songs that they picked were a majority, you know, vocal songs, me singing, mm-hmm. as opposed to me rapping, you know. So they took me as a singer. And they got back at me like, oh, so you singing, la, 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 this, that, and the other. We like this joint. We like that joint. So I was like, all right, let me try to sing a thing. See, you know, see what happens. Well, it's worked out pretty well. Do you ever miss rapping, though? I still rap. Yeah? Yeah. Do you have any golf raps? <laughs> you don't have to freestyle anything. <laughs> you need got, one to get through. My next rap battle. album is called Mulligan. <laughs> yeah. Extra Mulligan. Extra Mulligan. <laughs> Molly, yeah. So when you can can you just inform me more about? Dilla? I've been pretty obsessed with Dilla, and I like Mad Lib a lot, and he's an extension of Dilla in that sense. But just explain his influence on you, what happened with Slum Village, and just sort of how that helped to uh, launch you into that next phase. Um, well, I mean, Dilla did a lot for me even before I met him musically, and I didn't know who he was. For the longest time, I just liked this song for some reason. I liked this song for some reason. Um, once I started actually going in and, and buying records or, you know, cassettes and started looking, I'm like, you know, who is, who is J.D.? And what is, you know, mm-hmm. what is Uma? Like, they're attached to all these different songs that I like, you know. So um, after a while, once I started going to the shelter, and the shelter is like, you know, House Shoes used to just spend Dilla. He was J.D. then. He used to spend all J.D. stuff, like, unreleased you know, and I was like, yo, this is it. And one day I remember Dilla came to the to the shelter. And it was like, he was glowing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Last Dragon style. I'm like, yo, that's him. That's him right there. And this is like, he just oozed like, like, this is it. This is what I do. This is, you hear me on the speakers type, you know what I'm saying? Right. Type yeah. of, type of, uh, uh. Humble arrogance. Yeah. You know? He was still infatuated with the idea, I'm picking up just that, the enjoyment of hearing his art and how it was impacting people and then feeling that confidence and that sort of power that you feel when you are completely killing it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not that I know. But But it was never, like, like when I saw him, it was never to the point that that it make you want to hate on him, though. Right. You know what I'm saying? He, he was all. Like he was a, always like super, super humble. Yeah, that's everything I've read about him. He seemed like uh, a really solid guy, generous, yeah. like with his talents and f- collaborating with people. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. And he was always a go-to. Like, like once we actually met, you know, and, and, and kicked it, you know, I could always, I could always call him, and he'd be like, you know, I'd be like, yo, I'm trying to get this sound, or I need to get this clap. You know, he taught me how to like layer sounds on on the MP and. Always had like a little, a little bit of knowledge to throw me, you know, to, to take me to the next level, you know. Yeah, it's great because I, I don't think his recording style was necessarily the way he would control tracks and mix stuff wasn't necessarily conventional, was it? Like he was just all self-taught, right? Or was there? A I, I believe, I believe so. Yeah. No, I think I definitely, I definitely know he, uh, he, he, he did a lot of work with, uh, with uh, a few people, you know, you know, coming up. 
Um, what they taught him, I'm not sure. You know, what he took from him, I don't know. I wasn't there. That was before me. Yeah. You know, um, but but whatever they taught him, I know he was the, the first person that I heard to come with that type of style, you know. So I definitely think he took what was taught to the him. The way he, he made sampled and layered stuff, they're like, there's nothing about it. But just for my own ears, it's it has that whatever, that through line that when you listen to, whether it's the donuts or just any, like, just has this... Um, Consistency, but it's something to appeals to my ear. I can listen to it all the time. I oh, think yeah. it's genius all oh, the yeah. time. Um, and then, when did you end up recording? It wasn't couldn't have been too much long. Where you did you appeared on some tracks with Slum Village? Yeah. And then, did you tour with them too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did my first tour with Slum. Um, that was after the Rise album. That was after I got signed to Virgin. Um, maybe a couple years after that, so maybe around 2002, yeah. maybe, uh, is when Tainted came out. And I didn't know Tainted was going to be as hot as it was, you know, when we were first doing it. I remember RJ, the guy that uh, ran the studio, he was like, D, I don't think you understand, man. We got a smash, man. <laughs> you ain't trying to make no money, though, D. <laughs> That's exactly how he talked, and I'm done with, 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 with you know, impersonating people. I've been doing that all day. You but, have been. I've enjoyed your world yeah. tour of uh, impressions. <laughs> it's been good. Today. But, um, but yeah, that Tainted really, really, really jumped it off, and I think it lit a fire under Virgin and made them actually put my project out, because they were sitting on it for a while. They didn't know yeah. exactly what, what, what direction it How did you even get in front? Like, what was the catalyst for them to sign you? Was it? It was after Rise, or was it was it, after Rise. After Rise, yeah. And after my self- management took that, you know, took took those few songs and shopped it. Yeah, you know, it made it over to uh, Virgin UK. Yeah, they sent it back to the states. Like this guy's cool, you know. Sent it to the Virgin Virgin mm-hmm. in the states, and um, it just created a buzz, man. A lot of people. This is like right when, uh, like bootlegging was was really popping off, you mm-hmm. know. So a lot of people bootleg this Rise CD and it was making waves like in the industry everybody's like who is this right what does he look like what is this style you know so I think there was a lot of um, there was a lot of uh, mystery around the product you know around the product around the project you know and uh, I think all of that helped I think all of that helped at the end of the day and your experience with the labels um, you know it's probably been good and bad over over the years like I mean labels are uh, sometimes aren't the fairest or this type of situation. But are you with a, a label right now? Right. Um, yes and no. How does that work? I don't so, know. Can it's we kind of hard. It? It's not. It's not. It's not a major label. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everything comes comes out under a label, but we're still considered, you know, independent. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, that's got to be a good situation. It's definitely a good situation. You know, um, in dealing with majors, it's a lot of it's a lot of pressures that you got to deal with. Um, a lot of that was I didn't necessarily have to see because it was the label, then there was another umbrella, and then there was me, you know. So I was kind of shielded from a lot of that craziness with the label. Yeah. But, you know, every now and then some of that would leak through. <laughs> yeah. I don't really miss it. Well, and I think it's better to probably own all your music and, you know, have a... And well, and also you had the bass now that you you have a, a global base that you can just release stuff to, too. Yeah. And they can, they're waiting for it. They're ready for it. Definitely. And then uh, you get to keep a little bit bigger piece of the pie, I would imagine. It's and better. It's good now. Yeah, it's much better. How has the music industry changed in terms of, like, just the last five or six years from you becoming more sh- shifting independent? What have you been able to pivot to to be successful, more successful, in terms of how you release music and then tour, like touring is seems to be, you can always go to a major city now and do two or three dates or, yeah. and, and the city wineries now are all crazy and good mm-hmm. spots that seem to always do well for artists that have a, they seem to do really well for artists that have had success and they're sustaining it, but they're not like, they're not in the moment where they're, you know, uh, you know, at the top of the, 
you know, charts in terms of like right now, but yeah. there's always that thing going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm having a lot of fun at city wineries. You know, um, sometimes I feel like I get a little too comfortable in the city wineries, you know, <laughs> um, to the point that when I leave that small, intimate venue and I go do a, lo- a, a larger audience, I forget that I need to switch it up and I need to, I, I can't just be, I can't be cool crooner, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of got to like work the stage a little bit more, you know? Yeah. So, um, but, but, but city, wider, city, city winery has definitely been, you know, a good situation for me. What are you working on right now? Because it's been a minute since you've had an album. It's getting... been a while. But you don't really need, are you still thinking like you need to create albums or are you thinking about just song to song as long as you're staying in the creative mode? Yeah. Um, I eventually want to come with the album, you know, and uh, I definitely feel like I got about 50 more in me. 50 know? more albums? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I, got some, I got some songs in the stash too that I need to, you know, get out there. But uh, right now, <clears throat> uh, I'm working. I'm working on the next project slowly, a lot a lot, a lot more slowly than uh, than I used to work, you know. But uh, it's because that I got because a kid of now. Fa- family pressures, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that puts you the know, brakes on a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to, you know, I had to break for Pick a while. The moments but, um, between naps when you can uh, actually exactly, record. exactly. Yeah. You know, but um, I mean, every everything in this time, you know, it, 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 it's happening. It's about time for me to put another one out. Yeah. I'm sick of you know posting a picture about uh, my golf swing and. Half the comments are, yeah, where's the album? You know, so I think it's about time. It's about time to do it. Well, I'm impressed at your process because I would pop down and see you uh, when I had the studio in in this building. And, you know, you're you're laying out your own instrumentation. Sometimes you'll bring in somebody to just do a spot. uh, You know, you're you're directing, producing them. But in terms of what they're contributing, but you're playing, you're doing multiple instruments on everything and just you're crafting it right there and it seems like and that's still your approach now right you have your setup in your house now yeah so what usually comes first for you creatively like the idea is it just a hook or something that you hum and come back or is it what usually is the Um, first catalyst it can happen either way lately it's been lately it's been like a, a a hook a hook and um chords Mm-hmm. Chords, drums, and hook. I hear it. I try to get it on my, you know, on my notes in my phone the best I can. Mm-hmm. You know, I usually sit down at the keyboard and, and kind of play in mumble rap. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Whatever, whatever I feel, you know, is uh, the closest to to what I'm hearing in my head. And then I'll come back to it if I don't have time. You know, and, and try to mature it into something. Well, yeah, and keep working on that. Yeah, because like, you might not have. Lyrics can change based on, you know, you're just finding a flow, right? Yeah, you know, it's you, there's usually no lyrics from yeah. the jump, just the cadence. Yeah. Um, what What is your What do you think is your go to instrument? Like, if you had to say, well, what you know, what is your what What's your best instrument that you feel most comfortable with? Mm, most comfortable, probably keys. Yeah. Yeah, probably keys. Um, just because with keys, if I if I if I can't get a horn line right, you know, with the with the flugel, I can always pull up a, <laughs> the flugel instrument on the keys and and put it down until I you know until I feel comfortable enough to do it properly, you know. But uh, it always comes back to the keys, so that's probably the comfort zone. Yeah, well, and it's probably the best bass to have when you're writing music. I don't I don't know anything about music. But in terms of writing it, and I don't read music or anything, but it would seem like the piano would be the most useful tool when you're trying to create. Yeah, definitely. I say the piano or the or guitar. Or when I get really good at bass, I'll just write everything on bass. Exactly. Have there been anybody that writes music on a bass guitar? I have to check I'm out. I'm pretty sure. I'm yeah? pretty sure that has been. I want to be the first. No, nah, it's not going to happen. Oh. All right. Sorry. Well... <laughs> There's a lot of things that aren't going to happen in my life. I think. Well, you know, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. I think you should still get a bass and write a song on it. All right. I'd enjoy hearing that. Get shades you, on the you hook. You wonder why this guy from Grand Rapids, like, where is he keeping all this funk all this time? Man, you know? I think it'd be Can you imagine swaggy, if but... I came in with 
my bass guitar and I've practiced whatever crazy bass licks and funk licks and I plug into your amp and I'm like just ready to go and it's <laughs> it just drops like crazy <laughs> You'd be like, B, we're going on the road. I wouldn't be surprised, man, you know. <laughs> Usually if you're artistic in one area, you're artistic in, in another, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> well, the bass is one that I always... And the boy got swag. To me, I sort of feel this way as a photographer and what I do creative. Like, I don't have another option. Do you feel like you have any other option to make a living, like, in this vein, <laughs> in this vein as music? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Back to uh, mail communications? or uh, I don't think I'd do that. I mean, I'm not above it. I'd do it, but yeah. <laughs> I'd try a few other things first. <laughs> yeah. What other interests do you have? What, what, have you thought about a plan B if you ever wanted a plan B? Um, I mean, there's always, you know, management. There's always producing. Yeah. Um, I enjoy, you know... Building things and creating tables, you chairs. Are, yeah, you know? you've yeah. always building stuff. I Tell like, me about I like your bonsai. I, I'm fascinated. Oh, let's with talk the about bonsai. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> because you, when you go, what I've learned about you is if you start to have an interest, it's all in. Like it's right now, it's it. golf. It started out bonsai. Am I saying that right? Bonsai, right? Bonsai. Bonsai. Yeah. All right. I think maybe maybe I'm saying it wrong. Bonsai. I don't know. You say it your way. I'll Just say find it a way. happy medium, but medium bonsai. between bonsai and bonsai. Okay, like bonsai, 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 <laughs> bonsai, bones beyond. Yeah, bonsai. Bon. bonsai. Right. Thank you, shades. Thank you, shades. Thank We're you. good. Thanks. <laughs> um, he uh, well. So what appealed to you? I mean, you are a crafty dude. You, you built a lot of stuff in the in your first uh, the where when I met you, you had built a stuff. You're building stuff now. You renovated a bunch of stuff at your house. You seem to like getting your hands dirty. You like toys too. You were into drones for a while. Oh yeah, till they flew away and never came back. Yeah, there was uh, yeah our RC's, remote control uh, uh, drip your radio control. Yeah, the RC drip cars. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Definitely, man. This is such a random conversation because I, I'm a random person. Well, it kind of has to be random. <laughs> no, but it's just these things that are popping up that aren't connected to music industry or like hustling or your plan B. It's like, oh, you like radio control? Let's talk about that for thirty yeah. seconds. It's not. It's not a quality interview on my side. It's not your fault. It's me because I'm meandering. But uh, what was it about bonsai that was? Uh, what appealed to you about it? Because they are hard to grow properly. Yeah. You know, I've always loved uh, bonsai trees from Karate Kid. That was like the first time I remember seeing them. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I was always interested in them. I always thought they were cool, but I can never keep a house plant alive. You know, I, I bought a couple, uh, you know, small trees from like Home Depot. Yeah. And they live for about two, three months and then psh, it's a wrap. Right. You know, so I just, I just kind of, you know, Chalked it up is, I don't have a green thumb. I can't do it. And then one day, um, I had this cool bottle, uh, a liquor bottle or something. And I was like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one of those, uh, what are they called, terraniums or yeah. something like that? It's like, I'm, I'm going to make one of those. And I wonder if I can make like a little bonsai tree on the inside, you know, out of moss. So I started looking up like moss bonsai trees because I knew I just couldn't conquer a real bonsai tree. And then like that search kind of took me into, you know, back into bonsai. And then I started researching it, and I said, you know, let me prove to myself that I can do this. There's no reason why I shouldn't be able to keep this tree alive, you right. know? So I kind of jumped into it and kind of got stuck, man. And it's like once you know... But wait, how many bonsai trees have you killed? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> I like that there's not a certain number. No, if I had to guess, probably about... Six? Yeah. Seven? Yeah, but like really, really, so really. So you're a work in progress. Taking well, care I think of I'm good now. Yeah? I think I'm good. I mean, I've only been in it for two years. Right. You know, but um, my trees survived a winter. Which That's is, amazing. Is a, is a and good that was, start. last year was a hard winter, too. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I could not believe, I was in Japan one time, and 
I think I told you the story, but the I pulled off at a I was on like a tour bus thing, and we we were on a bus and we pulled off at like a, the equivalent of a, a rest stop mm-hmm. off the highway, and they were selling bonsai trees there, and there was a one of the bigger tree bonsai trees I've ever seen, and mm. the price tag after I did the conversion. It was like a twenty three thousand dollar tree or something crazy. I was like, yeah. "Who's dropping twenty three k on a tree at a rest stop?" Everybody. Like it had a, everybody. I don't know. I don't know about a rest stop though. That's crazy. Yeah, that's it was, crazy to me. I don't know. <clears throat> but that. What are you buying? What what's so the value? You're buying a, a two a hundred two hundred years of uh, somebody's care in the tree. Yeah, and it's a transfer, and but you have artwork. to give them cash. It's living artwork. So how do you? Control and shape a tree. Just yeah, a lot of wiring, um, a lot of patience, uh, and you kind of have to. I feel like you kind of have to be an artist already to jump in the bump. Well, you don't have to be, but it helps. Like if you know lines, if you know, if you know the way lines should, should yeah. flow. You know, uh, that's why I was trying to talk shades into getting into it. You know, because. I feel like his vision would be crazy. It's a it's a three dimensional type situation that you have to deal with. Yeah. And you have to achieve a triangle with the foliage from every angle. That's part of it, you know. So and you have to make it look like a real tree. Yeah. So it's like sculpting a little bit. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like a, a a growing sculpture yeah. all the time that you can shape. So you know, but it's got to be the most. Uh, I, to me, it doesn't. Necessarily appeal to me, just from like it just take too long. I'm too impatient. <laughs> you know, it's like well, two months later you see h- how that wire has helped it grow and shape or whatever. But you don't mind it. You're in it. You're in the long game. You're in the long game with the long game, man. I wish I'd have known about this 20 years ago, <laughs> so I could see a little bit of growth with my trees by now. All right, here's a segue. How's your long game in golf? My golf game is getting kind of strong, BK. I don't know if uh, you just want to pick up, you know, and dust your clubs off and, and meet me on the on the links, man. You might want to take it to the driver range I think, first. I really think, I, yeah, I'll commit to this, Dway. I will, I will play a round of golf with you still this year, at some point. Okay. We we'll, might only go nine. I'm cool with that. All right. We're definitely going to need a cart. Agree, and then, uh, and then if I run out of balls, that you just have to keep, you know, you have to stockpile the rest of the, the rest of the way. Okay, all right, is Sounds that a good. deal? Sounds good. All right, so what? So yeah, you 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 started playing golf. Your cousin was it? Your cousin or your brother? My brother. Your brother got you into it three months ago, and it's all you think about now. It's like oh, it's not all I think about, but <laughs> I do a lot of golf. It yeah. I dropped the kid off. Shades, thank you. We're okay. We're okay, Shades. We're good, Shades. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate you. <laughs> um, yeah, I dropped the kid off. I'm like, well, I got a little time. <laughs> so this I is why your me. album's taking so long. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not golf. <laughs> but no, I'll go play a quick nine. You know, I'm done before yeah. 12 o'clock. Sure. Yeah. Smash some lunch to go pick up the kid. Boom. Nap time for him. Boom. Lays, lay down some, some trumpet. Whatever, yeah. whatever needs to be done. Yeah, I like it. But what do you like about what? What appealed to you about golf? I mean, I know what I like about it, but I quit playing just for time management. And um, I do want to get back into it for sure. It's the nature, man. It's yeah. being in nature. <clears throat> I'm a big kid, so you know, driving the cart around is fun. You know, flying, hitting hills. You know, <laughs> seeing if you can make a, uh, a pitching wedge come out the bag. <laughs> You know, um, I mean, it's just a lot of fun, man, being out there with your people. Super Have people serene. done the old prank with you already where the, you don't know it, but they unloosen, they loosen up the, your bag? No, they, they, I didn't know that was a thing. That's a, Oh, yeah, that's I a thing. I knew about dude. the exploding ball. So then when you, like, for that. you just tramp down on the accelerator and you take off your, your clubs oh, going no, coop, bro. and the, your, your, your playing oh, partners. We're going to be fighting. <laughs> we're going to be fighting. That's a brand new bag, bro. Yeah, I know. Well, it's a thing. It's happened almost every golf outing. Somebody's like, it will loosen up someone's bag. Mm. 
and it might not happen right away. It's really funny when it doesn't happen right at the jump. <laughs> yeah, and then like it, they spill out over some corner, <laughs> and then there's like five clubs just littered with like all these clubs. Yeah, I'm gonna be fighting. I'm gonna fight somebody, man. Yeah. But uh, I find like golf too. It's like uh, there's something I don't know that you spend that you don't typically spend that much time with one person doing something right for an extended period of time so conversations end up meandering places you wouldn't normally take them yeah you know and then if you don't really like the person you're playing with you're like i gotta talk to this guy (laughs) exactly still more exactly i was hesitating when the if i a couple times i went as a single at the tee off and the starter would be like hey why don't you uh partner up with him you know so you don't have two two uh two just single guys playing out there right slow slow down play and you know, I'm getting paired up with somebody that's like just can't even <laughs> talk to really. It's just not fun. We should have did this on the golf course. Oh yeah, we should have. Yeah, next time. Next time, part two. I'll yep. have better questions. It won't be as dist- so. Radio control. Uh, you were one of the first dudes that I ever saw get a drone, and start mm. posting videos. Mm. And one in particular, uh, I'm pointing to it now, but the Ambassador Bridge. I could not believe. Were you, did you fly it from here all that far? And yeah. you flew it to Windsor? No, 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 no. The when I flew it to Windsor, I was <laughs> standing. I was I was on the Detroit side of the river. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Now. I wasn't. It, it wasn't from here. I flew it to uh, Comerica Park from the parking <laughs> lot of this place, though. Did you lose connection to it at all? No, no, no. It made no, it. It made it right over. That's it so illegal now. I know, like, right? I know. And the, back in those days, it was. Game yeah. on. You could do anything you wanted. I knew it was illegal to take it across to Canada when I did it. Yeah. But I did it, and it came back. <laughs> and they never caught me. Get shot down. Canadian Royal Air Force, just like... Security came and got me once when I took it up uh, the side of the Renaissance Center, the GM building. Oh, you flew it right. Yeah. Like, every probably... every floor was calling, like, yo... There's a drone looking at us right now. Right. And I was literally looking at it. It's all hotel rooms, too, so they think, like, you're peeping on them or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't. I, wasn't I always feel that. that way when uh, I'm flying in a city of uh, my drone, and then uh, there's, in Grand Rapids, there's a bunch of hotels downtown. But you want to just, like, fly through. But I know if I was in the hotel and I yeah, saw I'd a drone, right. it's like my mind would go, oh, that guy's super perverted. Right, right, right. Trying to I wonder if that's what they felt. At the Renson? Well, it yeah. is a hotel. Maybe it that's is. part of it. But also, I just think GM, I've done some photo shoots at the Renson, mm-hmm. and they have the tightest security of all time. Okay. They, they send you to a lot out back off of Atwater back there, mm-hmm. and there's a it's just empty parking lot right on the river, and there's a mobile home trailer like for security there. Yeah. And then you have to get out of your car, everybody, all the crew, everything. You have to go stand in the... the trailer and then they bombard your vehicle with so much uh x-ray and radiation and all this really? stuff that you can't even be near your vehicle wow while it's being scanned that's crazy it is i've never had anything like that and G, that's at gm so i was lucky to get out of that alive basically is what you're saying they they yeah. came down they came down on me pretty quick you know it, and then the what? How did it go when they came? Because I always get hassled. By I mean, he was cool. So, I think I yeah. think he saw me like okay, he's he's just because I was clearly just out there with the. It wasn't like I was trying You're to. Like, hide I just it. got this yesterday, so yeah, I'm just playing yeah. With it. I was clearly out there having fun. He was just yeah. like, you can't like, that. yeah, that's that's cool, man. You can't do that here. You got to take it somewhere else. <laughs> so he was cool about it. It wasn't. It wasn't. But yeah, you like gadgets. You like the the cars too. Like you you post some dope videos of. Uh, of just your, your car, your RC, mm. spinning out. Now, how long have you had a series of those too, of the of those cars? Those drift cars, I kind of got into last year too. Yeah, what's going on, man? man it's, that uh, was just fun. I blame, I blame my kid for that. I mean, I've always been into yeah. RCs, but I saw him. You know, his his interest was peaked. You know, with uh, with, with cars and trucks. You know, so. I was like, all right, cool. Well, let's go do this. And that kind of turned into the RC drifts. And then I found this whole, like, subculture of, you know, drift artists. <laughs> and, and I just got crazy into that, man. That was a lot of money. I spent a lot of money on them things. Yeah? Yeah. 
How much? How, like, what is the target? The one that you had that buggy, the one that the most recent one you've been posting with, because that thing is fast. Oh, uh, which one are you talking about? I don't know. It's that. It's the one you just put the all buggy, the, but with buggy. the stickers. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That one is crazy. It's expensive. You don't have to say if you're gonna get in trouble. If I'm gonna get in trouble, I don't know. <laughs> you trying to <laughs> domestic? <laughs> I don't want any domestic issues. Tonight. Oh man, come on. You trying to make me? Uh, a <laughs> no, you, you, you're money, independent. It's my money, Brian. <laughs> I ain't got to. You try, yeah, you trying to get me in trouble? Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it was a pretty I, penny. Yeah. But it's worth it. They're fun, man. They last. Yeah, they last a while. I can fix it myself if, if yeah. something goes wrong with it. You know, so. That's great. I it's I fun for me and the kid, man. We both yeah. enjoy it. How is that Ashton now? You got a boy, Ashton. Yeah. He's three. Or three. Three. Yep. Killing it. Yeah. My main concern, I've talked to you about this before, is he's not, <clears throat> my concern, he's not getting enough m- multicultural, like, from <laughs> what I can bring. Uncle Brian can bring some, right. uh, expand, you know, expose him to some of my culture. Okay. You know? Okay. <laughs> We're going to have you over, you know, bring a potato salad or something. <laughs> <laughs> We're now putting, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what, what, what? Yeah, what are the stereotypes? We don't. Uh, I'll probably. Cu- I'm going to cut this because it's just crazy. <laughs> what are? What would a white? What is a white stereotype that I would bring to your picnic? Oh, uh, that you would bring to my picnic. <laughs> definitely, definitely potato salad. Potato salad. Definitely potato salad. And uh, is it pumpkin pie? Pumpkin pie. We love pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie. It's seasonal though. Yeah. You know, it's hot. You we eat, eat sweet potato pie. Right. They're not the same. Well, I mean. They're, they I look the I same. I can't tell the difference. You really? Yeah, I really don't eat either one though. Well, see, so you're you're already breaking stereotypes. There it is. It's fine. You've always been a trailblazer, dude. Hey, breaking down barriers, man. That's what we do. <laughs> we do it together. Yeah. All right. So I want. I do want to pivot to uh, a traumatic event in your life, if you don't mind. I know you 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 don't often talk about it, but you've had to talk about it occasionally. You talked about it at Fa- Failure Lab a little bit. But your father, when you were young, was murdered just down the street from you. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what... I've never really talked to you about it other than what I read and what I heard you talk about that, mm-hmm. that one night in Detroit. But how did that really shape you either from at the time when you look back at it now? Because I don't know many people that had somebody taken from them in that way. Right. And... And I'm just curious how that's affected you cur- cur- creatively, your vision. You're very driven. You know, I, I don't know how it speaks in there, but how, um, if you're willing to dive into that for a minute. Yeah. Um, looking back, I know, like, like once it happened, when it first happened, uh, I don't know why, but I got really quiet. You know, I wasn't really comfortable talking to people or people ask me how I felt I just I didn't have any words for them you know I didn't have any words <clears throat> I kind of I kind of got quiet I kind of got to myself um I want to say music was it, it it turned it turned into a way for me to it turned into a form of expression a way for me to speak you know um and so I really think in a way music was kind of like Music was my therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, music was my therapy. Um, and not even just for that instance, but, like, like going forward in life, anything that I was going through, if I had a, a riff with a certain person and I didn't know the words to fully express to them how I felt, I would write a song about it. You know, even if it wasn't necessarily writing words, you know, I would uh, take that emotion and I would put it into the music for a song. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certain songs now that I can listen back to it, and just hearing the music alone, I know what I was feeling. You know, or I or it takes me back to a time I remember what I was going through at that time. Yeah. You know, and in losing my pops, it kind I think it kind of forced me to to find ways to express myself. You know. Well, I, yeah, I think that it would be natural to kind of be uh, more insular at first. You know, very inside. You know. You, wants to talk about that you don't even know how to process it you yeah. know and then everybody's asking how you're doing 
You don't want to talk to them. Right. Yeah. But having the outlet of music, I'm sure, yeah. Because it's such an emotional arc that you can create with music. Yeah. And that became therapy for you. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So the, the, the other thing I have to, to, to ask about is just more of your collaboration with Kanye and the Grammys. And your Grammys at your mom's house, right? Is that where you keep them? <laughs> she has everything. She has everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to keep yeah. it. She keeps everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Collabing with Kanye was a uh, that was a good time, man. That was a good time. I remember uh, me and Kanye had worked. I can't say we worked. We had we had done a few shows together early on <clears throat> uh, in Chicago at a muse- museum. Uh, Dusabu, Dusabu du Museum, I think I think it's called something like that. It's been a while, but uh, we did a couple shows together, where I like open up and then he finished, and then like the next show he'd open up and I finished. You know, it was a good time, man. And that's uh, that was like the our introduction to each other. After that, we worked together uh, via Slum Village. We showed up, you know, at a at a couple different uh, uh, video shoots with him. You know, with each other. Yeah. And uh, then he called me to come out and work on his album with the flashing lights. And uh, that was a good experience, man. You know, just because at this point, you know, we're all going for the same thing. We're trying to get to that end result, which is like a a dope song, a fun song, you know. Yeah. And working with him showed me that there's different ways to go about doing it, you know, um, depending on your audience. Yeah. And depending on what you're trying to get across with the song, you know. If I can, re- there's one thing I relate to is that I've never, like, I think if you're, you create your own music, you, you record it all, you know, I mean, it isn't like, um, I mean, I'm sure there's times you go into a studio to do certain things for albums, but you pretty much, it's just, it, it seems to me my impression of how you work is it's pretty much, it's you making it, mm-hmm. you know, and layering it and doing everything with it in terms of the writing and the recording of everything. And I did that with photography. I never assisted anybody. I never saw any else, anybody else work or how they lit things or like. And if I now I'm around a photo shoot or see a shoot happening, like you going in and seeing Kanye's, you end up picking up some things yeah. where you're like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. Came at it that way. Right. Never seen that done before. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And but what was his uh, what was the main impressions from that then? Just about Kanye as an artist, like as a um, person, <clears throat> as an artist with that flash and light song. I remember getting to New York, um, getting to the studio in New York before he got there, and the uh, engineer was like, "Well, I got the song pulled up, and uh, I got his reference vocal. He already had, you know, how he wanted the hook to go." And uh, I was like, "All right, well, cool. Well, let me just run in there and lay it." Then when he gets here, you know, we can figure it out. So I went in the booth, you know, and I did it Dwale style. You know, I did the main line, you know, the, uh, the as you recall, you know, uh, the, the, just the main melody. And then I started putting all of these Dwale harmonies over the joint, you know, taking it up, bringing it down, you know, doing all this craziness in there. And we were all listening to it like, yeah, the smack, the smack. <laughs> and um, we were just sitting there talking. And Kanye walks in, so we greet, you know, sit down, talk, catch up for a minute. And he's like, all right, let's cut this. I'm like, I already cut the vocals. He's like, oh, okay, well, let's hear it. And I put it on. He's rocking to it. And the hook is over. And he's like, that's dope. That's dope. Um, but I'm trying to rock stadiums. I'm like, okay. He was like, so let's take away all the harmonies and let's just leave that melody. So he snatched all the harmonies and just left the melody. And he played it. He's like, that's it. And that was it. Just so simple. I came out. I came out of that situation learning that sometimes less is more with music. Well, and it's how I guess what I'm picking up too is the you know how singular his vision was. Like how like, I mean, what they say about him is he's just so uh, he knows what he almost, wants. He knows what he wants, yeah. but oftentimes way ahead of what other people are thinking. And someone's like, "What do you mean stadiums?" Yeah, you know, and it's like, no, I'm gonna make music for stadiums, and that's amazing. And he did singular in his vision, yeah. And he for did, sure. yeah. Well, cool. And then you ended up so you because of those credits, uh, that album won uh, some Grammys, and then you were yeah, I think it was like Song of the Year, something like that. Yeah. Also working with Common, 
um, for the people. Yeah. That got nominated that year. Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of juice does a Grammy give you or that association? Um, you can always say Grammy winner. It's a, it's a good title. Yeah. It's a good title. <laughs> you don't want to give it back. Oh, no, nah, man. Keep it. You know, sometimes you, uh, you can get a couple more zeros. Yeah. You know, behind, behind some situations, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are all just tools, right? Like, money is just tools to make something else, uh, something better or something bigger. or Boom. Yeah. Or just make your life easier. Easy. Yeah. New set of clubs. <laughs> all day. <laughs> what? New RC. Add some zeros. <laughs> yup. Yeah. Some, some Callaways, you know? <laughs> I got some Callaways, man. Three months in, I got Callaways. What's your favorite city to play? Do you have one? Like, mm. if, you, if you could just... Just and then why? Is it the crowd? Is it a venue? Hmm. I really like. That's kind of tough, man. You know, it varies. Yeah. From city to city, depending on what's going on, what type of event it is. Atlanta is always pretty uh, consistent. Oakland is always fun. D.C. is always fun, man. It's too many. New York yeah. is always crazy. Chicago, it's too many, man. Yeah, it's too many. It's always a good. It's always a good time. You know, <clears throat> with every show is always that one thing that happens during the show that makes you say, "Oh man, this this was the best one." Yeah. Every time there's that moment that makes you say, "This was the best one. This was the best <laughs> one." You know, it's always it's always special, man. It's amazing. What what do you think makes up your particular fan? Is there a you know? You know, if you had to, like, say, this is kind of a cross-section of my fans and the type of music that they like, hmm. it's the... Hmm. I feel like my fans are, like... All my fans kind of, like, ride the fence between lovers of hip-hop, lovers of soul, lovers of jazz. Like, they're in that yeah. area. But <clears throat> I can't even really say that, man, because... It's a it's a few it's a few like house techno people that that, that, that kinda come out and rock with me too, mm. you know. It's That's kinda great. all over the place and I love it. Mm. That's what I like about it. Did you did you end up going to college? I did a couple years. I did a couple years in Wayne State. And then how did but were you studying music or just like a normal college thing? Just just regular credits. Yeah. Um I did end up taking a music class. I took one music class. And I hated it because it's like it, it started all the way over from it was like the the beginning, you know, like two weeks into the class. They're like, OK, we're going to make a song now. And I'm like, finally, she was like using C, D and E. And I'm like, come on, man, this can't be like, you know, so I think I started a little too. A little too base. Right. I probably right. should have jumped in a little, a little higher, a little higher up. But. Yeah. And then I just had the flashback. I almost forgot about it. But we, I, I don't know how that association came up with Berkeley. But Berkeley Music oh, in yeah, Boston. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I happened to be in Boston at the same time as you. And you're like, why don't you come to this, uh, <laughs> this uh, thing? The, this class is performing my music. And they've brought you in to, like, surprise them. Yeah. Because right? yeah. it was all on the down low. And then there was a reception and a talk after that yeah. you gave, but they were flipping out because they just spent like the semester learning my music, learning yeah. your music. So how did this collaboration come up? Where the students uh, at Berkeley were actually yeah, there was a course, yeah, that was a Dwelle's music course, yeah, and so they immersed themselves in your music as a class. So how did that even come about? So I th think the uh, the director of the ensemble. The Dwelling Ensemble was Tia Fuller. I think she's the one that brought it to Berkeley. And uh, I think she played saxophone for Beyonce. Oh, really? She's really dope. Yeah. Like, I saw her last time, uh, uh, the last Detroit uh, Jazz Festival. Not the one that just passed, but the one before. Mm -hmm. She came out for that, and uh, we actually got a chance to kick it. But that was crazy. Like, I, like just to hear, you know, Berkeley is, is full of, like aliens, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> the lack off of a the better term. Well, you meaning from the the talent base, the or? talent, yeah. you know, the writing, yeah. the you know, just like some some of the horn licks that they put together for some of the songs was just beyond me, you know. And um, I remember you being really touched it. because we met we met for a drink, 
then we went to the show, but we had to be, they were doing a recital, basically, right? Mm-hmm. They were performing it. And so they ushered us up to this balcony because they didn't want us to, anyone to see you. Yeah. And then, uh, but I remember, yeah, you being really kind of blown away with the talent, yeah. the, what, what they did and, and how they played and interpreted your music. It was just amazing, man. It's always crazy. You know, coming up being in music, that's like, that's what you want. You want to be able to get your music out there so people can hear it and hopefully, you know, enjoy it and love it, man. And to to know, you know, for me to know that this is something that started in the back room of my mother's house off of Exit 9, <laughs> you know. Exit 9. And now all the way in Berkeley, I have kids that probably were two, three years old when I made that music. They're actually right. performing this on stage. And I'm here to see it, you know. Yeah. Like to see their interpretation of something I heard, of some mumble rap that I heard in my mind, you know. Right. And it was just crazy, man. At at a certain point, you know, it 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 it, it turns the liquid, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It right. kinda it kinda turns the liquid, man. And I had one of those moments. For sure. And also, you know, Berkeley's one of the most esteemed music colleges, yeah. uh, schools in the world. And to have that association, just to have a course named after you, so may, or you know, uh, have them study you and do that for a semester. Yeah, it had to be, and it was so cool to be there. Like you were so generous for that. I, I don't even know why I was in Boston, but um, well, I, and anyway, it doesn't matter why I was there. But I was like, <laughs> hey, I'm in Boston. We're both we're both gonna be there. I yeah. think I saw you here in Detroit, and we were saying we were saying goodbye or something, and. You're like, where are you headed? And it's like, I'm going to Boston. You're like, I'm going to be in Boston. Yeah. So we were there at the same time. And you're like, yeah. well, you got to come to Berkeley. So yeah. I was your special guest for that. And that was super dope. And uh, and it was a cool talk after. But, like, um, to see the reverence of the kids after when you did a little panel talk. And they asked you, peppered you with a lot of questions. Like, uh, I got a little bit of that what you experience a lot more frequently is people just being in awe of you mm. and just your, you know, there is that presence that you have that especially if people are, have this thing in your mind. It's like when you're talking about, um, you have this impression of somebody and you build them up in your mind. Mm. I remember that Berkeley situation. I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do the panel at the end, just because I know that they're all trained in music. Right. I was not really trained in music. A lot of the a lot of the stuff I do, you know, I just I just play what I hear. It's feel, yeah. You know, and I was scared. Like one of those questions were going to come up, like, well, when you decided to go to an augmented ninth <laughs> with the C, and why didn't you take it to a diminished fifth? And I didn't want to be like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know <laughs> Japanese. You know what I'm saying? And I felt that moment coming, man. I, I really can't remember what we talked about, but I felt like they kind of held back those technical, you know, questions. Yeah, they weren't. They were more. Uh, yeah, it was more about into. They didn't get too technical. Yeah, yeah, it was more about like. But don't you think though that part of that that te- you can be too technical in music and it loses, it, you lose whatever. There's something magical. Yeah, you have to have technical skills, but at some point you have to know those skills enough that you can break the rules yeah. to create something that's more about it. You know what? I think I'm finding a lot of that nowadays. It used to, I feel like it used to be if you're too technical, then you have no feel. Most people with the feel probably don't have the, the technical behind it, but I feel like now with uh, the fact that you can get knowledge from anywhere, I think it's a lot of people like fine, riding that fine line of, of, of technical and feel, you know, yeah. and it's a lot of crazy musicians and artists coming out of that. Was there anything you thought you would talk about? Oh, um, I or think you want to cover? I think we covered everything, man. Yeah, yeah. I think we covered everything. I think you did a very, very good job, <sighs> Brian Thanks. Kelly. Thank you, my yeah. Detroit. It's kind of like you're my Detroit mentor, Dad, guiding me, making sure I don't uh, get murdered in the city, <laughs> saying the wrong thing. <laughs> Exit nine. Oh you always, man. You've always been very nice. No, I really do appreciate you as a friend. You've been always very generous to me. I've loved the photo shoots that we did. We're going to do one. This is the first podcast we've done where we're not going to do the portrait first. Right. Usually it starts with the portrait. Okay. And then we'd have the conversation. But we started with the conversation. 
now we're doing a quick portrait. But I don't know how many times I've shot you. Maybe four or five times. Yeah, yeah. And they're always fun. Yeah. You did our pregnancy up... shoot? Oh, yeah, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. And now I'm disconnected from Ash. I feel like I think he needs me. He needs, he needs a, you, like, occasionally just, you know, Uncle B come in, make sure he's a well-rounded young man. We're going to make him well-rounded, man. <laughs> Definitely. No doubt. Let's make that happen. Well, you have a beautiful life, a beautiful career, and uh, I just uh, really appreciate that you would sit down and kick it with me. I appreciate it, man. All right, man. Thanks. Yeah. Well, there it was. There's my conversation with Grammy winner Dwelle. You can tell what a cool guy he is, and I just am so appreciative to him. And I also need to give a special shout out to Shades. Uh, who we also did a podcast with. He allowed us to uh, kind of post up in his loft at 2000 Brooklyn, where um, I, I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast that uh, I had also had a photo studio there for a couple of years. Dwell, I used to live in that building. And so we just set up in uh, Shade's loft and had the conversation there and um, did the portraits right outside, um, right outside 2000 Brooklyn Street. Uh, using some of the building there. Uh, please check out, uh, by the way, Dwelle's episode page. I put a whole bunch of cool portraits I've shot of Dwelle over the years. There's the ones I shot specifically for the podcast. There's the ones uh, I shot a few years ago, and then the original ones that I shot for the Detroit Portrait Project that I mentioned early on, that personal project that started off all of these cool, amazing relationships that I have now in Detroit. And so please, uh, in general, please check out fullexposurepodcast.com. It is a great way to see the portraits, watch video clips of my conversation with Dwelle and all my other guests. And, um, and uh, I'm just excited. You should, uh, it's a cool time for the podcast. I'm glad you're listening. Thank you very much for listening. Please share the podcast. Uh, we are the next, uh, four, two or three months, we'll be releasing a lot of episodes from Los Angeles and then a couple more from Detroit, plus some from the studio here. So we're hitting on all cylinders and I'm feeling pretty good about it. And, uh, I hope you're feeling pretty good too. So let's, uh, let's get after it. People have a great week. Take care. This Full Exposure podcast episode has been made possible through the support of Metro Health, University of Michigan Health, and Dr. Peter Hahn, who believe that creativity and the arts are essential to a rich, healthy, and fulfilling life.